Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. We, I think we have a, uh, an exciting panel to talk about the IRS and its rulemakings and the various uh, things going on there for uh, nonprofits in the political space. We have uh, a fantastic panel tonight um, that I'd like to introduce. Directly next to me is Cleta Mitchell. She's a partner at Folium Lardner, where she practices political law. Uh, Cleta, um, as you'll, I'm sure, quickly come to, to find, is on sort of the right side of our spectrum tonight. She's the chairman of the American Conservative Union Foundation and served as president of the Republican National Lawyers Association. Uh, Cleta has taught at Sandy School um, at Harvard and also is a Shapiro Fellow at the School of Media and Public Affairs here at GW. She's been involved in a lot of Supreme Court litigation, testified before Congress on campaign finance matters, the whole uh, gamut. Cleta uh, got her both her uh, bachelor's and um, law degree from the University of Oklahoma. And then she comes to the political law space as a natural because after she graduated from law school, she was a member of the Oklahoma State Legislature for a couple of terms. Um, and I have to would be remiss if I didn't point out that Cleta um, gave me my start in the political law space. I was a law clerk for Cleta when I was uh, here at GW as in my, during my first summer. Next, we have uh, John Pomeranz from Harmon, Kern, Spelberg, and Eisenberg. He's a nationally recognized expert on uh, lobbying and election-related issues, similar in, I think, in scope to, to what uh, Cleta does. Uh, John um, came to, to Harmon Kern from the Alliance for Justice, where he worked on um, sort of expanding uh, advocacy efforts for nonprofits. John's a graduate of Wesleyan University uh, for his undergrad and uh, USC uh, for his law degree, and then he has an LLM from uh, Georgetown. And I must say, one of the things that, that I loved about uh, John's website, being a slightly smaller firm, is that he gets to have fun on his website. And he's uh, John likes to cook, according to his uh, biography. And next time, instead of pizza, we're going to have UIK with barbecue that we talk about, yeah, about on there. Finally, we have uh, Paul Ryan from the uh, his senior counsel at the Campaign Legal Center. Paul litigates campaign finance cases. He's an expert in ethics. He's appeared before the FEC. Um, he's, I think maybe it's fair to describe him as sort of general thorn in the side of John and Cleve's clients many times um, <laughs> in some respects. Uh, Paul's a graduate of um, UCLA for law school and uh, University of Montana for um, his undergraduate degree. So without further ado, we'll uh, dive right into our discussion tonight to talk about um, 501c4s. And I thought we'd maybe start out with um, sort of a few setting the stage questions to make sure everyone um, understands what we're talking about and what the issues are. So, Cleo, I was wondering if you could just kind of briefly explain to everyone what a 501c4 is, um, how that differs from a 501c3, so everyone can get a sense of things. Okay, well, thank you for having me, and I'm glad that you uh, confessed to having uh, worked uh, okay. for me. I have to tell you that I knew Ron Jacobs was a brilliant uh, lawyer from the day he walked at the door, and uh, I have been, I feel like a proud mother. Uh, all these years because he's, he's such a great lawyer and uh, does credit to GW Law School. Um, you know, I try to explain to people that, you know, here's what I do in my day job. Uh, people come to me and they say, you know, I say, tell me what you want to do in the policy or political process and I will help you figure out what is the correct platform, the correct legal structure, etc. That's what John does, that's what I do. And, um, you know, in order to do anything in America in the, in the actual legal marketplace, as opposed to the black market with which I am not familiar and in which I do not work, um, but if you, if you want to open a bank account, you have to have a number. And if it's a person, when you open a bank account, you give them your social security number. Well, if you're not a person, you have to give them a num the bank a number, and you get that number from the IRS, and that number is given to you, and you have to tell the IRS on a form what it is, what kind of entity it is, other than a real person, that for which you are seeking the employer identification number. And um, whether it's a for-profit, a not-for-profit, a, a trust or an estate, uh, all, you know, there's a category for everything in the tax code. And for a not-for-profit, there are many, many categories. And truly, John uh, can talk about this probably even more than I can because he's a tax guy. And, uh, and he, he actually has a tax thing. And, um, but for, uh, if you want to be, a, a 501c4 uh, is a social welfare, you might always say it's a grassroots lobbying group. It's kind of a catch-all. Uh, you know, other provisions of the tax code, you know, a charitable organization, we have very specific things, a church, a school, an educational, scientific, literary, uh, religious, 
uh, you know, a labor union is a 501c5, and a business uh, league is a 501c6, and a social club or <coughs> 501c7, I guess. Anyway, but so really the one that is kind of, if you can't think what else you are, then you're probably a 501c4 because it's kind of a miscellaneous, you know, for the gen operating, you know, for the general welfare. And, um, yeah, I want to say one other thing that I've heard members of Congress in these hearings say over and over again, which just makes me, it's just like fingernails on the blackboard. They think that, they say, well, why should we be, uh, you know, people who give, why should people get tax deductions for supporting political activity? Well, a 501c4 organization is required by law to tell prospective donors that your contribution to our organization is not tax deductible. For, as a charitable contribution for federal income tax purposes. All tax deduct, all tax exempt means is that the contributions that come to an organization are not subject to income tax. Uh, tax exempt organizations pay lots of other taxes. But a 501c4 is permitted to engage in a limited amount of political activity as long as its primary purpose and its primary property expenditures are for non-political purposes. And that has been the rule for a very long time. And only because people like Paul keep trying to upset the apple cart uh, do we have this uh, enormous mess on our hands. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that 501c4 is really the appropriate tax status for most of the people who come to see me who are interested in working on a particular issue or particular uh, concerns. And they're not primarily trying to influence elections. They may want to do some political activity, but not that's not what they want to do primarily. And um, they really want to try to influence public policy. It's the right place for them. And uh, that's what it is. I'm just going to get out of the way here. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, do you have anything you'd like to uh, add to that framework? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, you, I'm happy to stick with the questions as because I think we're, we're going to get, we have plenty of time to get to some of the other areas and areas I may disagree with Cleedon. But I do want to say I'm flattered to have been given credit, at least partial, for upsetting this apple cart and prompting uh, everything that's going on now. I, I appreciate the flattery. Um, one of the things we hear a lot about is sort of the dark money in politics. I, I put scary air quotes about dark money when I say that. Um, Paul, are, are contributions to 501c4s disclosed anywhere? Does the public know who gives to these organizations? So the answer is it depends, but for the most part, no. And there are at least two different major bodies of law at play here, tax law, campaign finance law. And then within the realm of campaign finance law, you have federal campaign finance law that applies only to candidates and political committees and other groups raising and spending money to influence federal elections. And then every state has its own campaign finance laws. And the variety in those laws is one of the, one of the reasons that the answer is it depends. But again, for the most part, the answer is no. So federal tax law does not require 501c4 organizations, 501c4 corporations to disclose their donors to the public. There are provisions in campaign finance law that at least on their face do or would. Um, under federal law, for example, there is a requirement that any person defined broadly to include corporations, humans, inclu corporations including nonprofit, C4s, um, 527 groups, you name it. Anyone who spends money on either of two types of ads to disclose um, their donors under certain circumstances. So the ads that trigger this disclosure requirement can be characterized as express advocacy type ads, ads that explicitly say vote for or vote against candidate X, candidate Y. Um, and then the second type of ad we call electioneering communications. And they are ads that do not contain that type of explicit vote for or vote against language, but they do clearly identify a candidate within 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general election. Under federal law, this only applies to TV and radio ads and that are targeted to the relevant electorate. So when Congress passed that law as part of the McCain-Feingold law, the statute says any group, any person or group that spends more than $10,000 in a calendar year on these electioneering communications must disclose the name and address of all contributors who contributed $1,000 or more to such group. The FEC promulgated a regulation in 2007 that said these organizations only have to disclose their donors who give for the purpose of furthering the advertising. This 
essentially mirrored what had been the standard for the express advocacy type ads for decades. So, in re so the, the law now of the land at the federal level is a group spending money on candidate ads, including C4s, only have to disclose their donors if they give for the purpose of furthering the ad. What we've seen since the Citizens United decision in 2010, which really opened the door for C4 corporations to spend money in federal elections, we've had more than $400 million spent by these groups on these types of ads without disclosing their donors. Why? Because they say no one gave us money for the purpose of furthering the ads, even though some of these groups running these types of ads is most of what they've done. There's an interesting little side road to this tale, and that is one type of tax exempt group that Clee didn't talk about, but we'll have time to talk about more during this hour, are these 527 organizations. That's the section of the Internal Revenue Code, the federal tax code, that provides tax exempt status for groups that are all about candidate elections. We're talking about candidate committees, party committees, from city council races all the way up to the president, DNC, RNC. The reason they don't owe Uncle Sam income tax is because of Section 527. Back in 2000, um, up until 2000, I should say, there was no requirement that 527 groups disclose their donors to the public via the IRS. Um, most of these groups up until 2000 were disclosing through the Federal Election Commission as political committees, but in the late 90s there was a growth of groups that were claiming tax exemption under Section 527 but not showing up at the FEC and registering and reporting as political committees. So Congress had a bill pending in 2000 to require a tax code amendment that would require disclosure by these 527 groups of their donors. At the time, many Republicans, including some of the most high-profile Republicans, such as Senator Mitch McConnell, opposed that bill on the grounds that it didn't go far enough, that it didn't include 501c4 groups in the donor disclosure requirements. And I have some great quotes from the congressional record from 2000 of Senator McConnell. Um, I'll save them because I generally don't like being read to when I'm in your shoes, but if there's any debate over whether or not that happened, I'm happy to read you these quotes because they're pretty clear. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there with the question or my answer to the question of whether or not these contributions are disclosed. There's a variety of reasons. The simple answer is no. Generally, these C4s are not disclosing their donors. Why do you think that's a bad thing? I think it's a bad thing for the same reasons eight members of our Supreme Court think it's a bad idea. Back in Citizens United, eight of the court's nine members went on at some length about the virtues of disclosure. In fact, they offered disclosure as the remedy for any fear of corruption or appearance of corruption that might arise from C4 or other corporate spending. And Citizens United itself, it should be noted, is and was at the time a 501c4 corporation. So Citizens United wasn't, um, at least on its face, about big business money, it was about C4s like Citizens United, who happened to take some money from business corporations. But what eight members of the court wrote in Citizens United was shareholders and citizens with the information needed, or Citizens United stated that disclosure provides, quote, shareholders and citizens with the information needed to hold corporations and elected officials accountable for their positions and supporters. The First Amendment protects political speech and disclosure permits citizens and shareholders to react to the speech of corporate entities in a proper way. This transparency enables the electorate to make informed decisions and give proper weight to the different speakers and messages. Eight members of the court think disclosure is important for that reason, giving voters information, giving consumers information, giving shareholders information, and I agree with those eight members of the court. Why do you not want to be disclosed? Well, let me just say this. What the, what the Supreme Court said was that for purposes of making the kinds of communications that Citizens United was making, which the court construed to be, it was Hillary the movie, they wanted to do um, ads promoting Hillary the movie, and um, the court said, you know, well, it's really tantamount to express advocacy, and therefore the uh, disclosure rules that attach to independent expenditures um, should apply, reporting and the disclaimer uh, requirements. They did not say that the donors to Citizens United per se should be disclosed. They said that the donors to those, that the FEC rules regarding uh, contributions to ex independent expenditures should apply. And I think that that's a really important thing. I mean, I think that what we have, we, what we confused here is um, that Lots of 501, 501c4 organizations, I think what Paul would like to see is that there are political expenditures, well maybe not, maybe I, I'll let him speak for himself, 
But it seems to me that the debate should be about whether or not there is sufficient court disclosure for uh, contributions to the political expenditures of a 501c4. But look, I mean, I don't think that people should have to be subject to, uh, if they join an organization, if they participate in an organization, I and mean, we have a First Amendment right of association. And I think that the big question is, if you want to say why should uh, people not want their contributions disclosed, well, ask Harry Reid. Ask the Senate major Majority Leader, who has on his official taxpayer-funded website, as we speak, something which I believe is a violation of the Senate rules, which is a posting about the Koch brothers. And, the, you know, they, the Koch brothers are, are undeterred. They're billionaires. But what the, the message that he is sending is, you want to give money to these conservative groups? Tie on your track shoes. The people who want disclosure are not looking for transparency, in my view. They're looking for a target list. And, I, and there have been organizations on the left that have sprung up with an announced goal in August of 2008 and forward, that their goal is to send, is to ferret out the donors to conservative groups and to send them letters telling them we're going to turn you over to the IRS, we're going to file suits against you, we're going to file DOJ complaints against you, and you know that, and they have in fact done that. So my view is that you know, first of all, you know, Paul and his and his comrades in the uh, campaign finance jihad reform movement, um, they say, oh, first it was soft money. We've got to get rid of soft money, soft money, soft money. Okay, they got rid of soft money. And now it's, oh, we got rid of dark money. we got to get rid of dark money, dark money, dark money. I wonder who thinks up these terms. But in any event, um, you know, and I finally realized, you know, it's not just soft money. It's not just dark money. What they really want is to have the only good money in politics be tax money. And I just philosophically don't agree with that. John, what do you think about this? Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, very good, both of you. Both on message. Well done. <laughs> I'm, I am delighted, Cleta, that you are upset about um, the demonization of the poor Koch brothers. I, I appreciate that you were also as outspoken when George Soros was getting whipped around. I was. The, I, I was um, the ones whipping him. I, um, uh, and, um, you know, uh, I... I, I I'll, I'll let Paul defend himself on disclosure. I, I don't think that anybody um, is trying to create a disclosure regime uh, so that um, a, a few people can can whip up um, uh, jihads against, uh, against, donors. against donors. I think there are some examples of that where you try and, you know, target a, a high-profile person and use them to hang it around the neck of a candidate who's embarrassed by their ties to some evil plutocrat of some sort or another. But I think, by and large, disclosure is designed to give people more information about the candidates they vote for as to who is supporting these people. Why is that person giving them all that money? Could it possibly be because that person has a significant interest in the outcome of decisions that that elected official is going to make, say, a judge in West Virginia or something like that, um, just to pick a hypothetical example. Um, so I, I think the rhetoric is, um, like everything else in this town, been ratcheted up to a significant degree. I think that it is true that there is a legitimate and important role for 501c4s to play, that they are a vital um, tool for people to organize together, you're right, Cleta, and advocate for the policies that they believe in, and that there is a legitimate uh, expectation of a certain amount of privacy for um, individual donors to an organization. But it's also true that if somebody is using some sort of Potemkin 501c4 to run money through, um, uh, particularly if that c4 isn't actually complying with the requirements of 501c4, because they are engaged in an excessive amount, whatever that may be, of uh, electoral activity, um, that that's a problem too. So that's what I think of this. I think that there is right on both sides, and I, I am uh, hopeful. You placed them well at the table. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Paul, did you have anything you wanted to? Uh... Yeah, definitely. I want to, before we leave this, the most basic question about disclosure. Um, I disagree with Cleta's 
reading of Citizens United, I'm not going to call any names. I'm, I'm not going to use jihadist or comrade or any of that language. But I will disagree, disagree vehemently with the interpretation of Citizens United that the disclosure provisions of Citizens United, the court's discussion and upholding of disclosure provisions in Citizens United was limited to express advocacy or the functional equivalent of express advocacy. Indeed, if you read that section of the Citizens United decision, the court was presented with that argument and eight members of the court squarely rejected it. They used phrases including, we reject that contention. They cited a Supreme Court decision in a case called Harris from the 1950s in which grassroots lobbying disclosure was upheld. It was completely unrelated to elections, let alone express advocacy. They ruled much more broadly than CLETA interprets the opinion as having ruled. The communications at issue in Citizens United gave the court good reason to reject that contention because the ads for the movie, they did indeed conclude that the movie, Hillary, was the functional equivalent of express advocacy. But three of the ads for that movie were in the record. They were being litigated, whether or not disclosure requirements applied to them. And they could not fairly be characterized as the functional equivalent of express advocacy. One of them was something along the lines of, you think Hillary looks good in a pants suit? Wait till you see the movie. Something like that. I mean, nowhere close to what folks who have been fighting to narrow the definition of express advocacy for decades would acknowledge as the functional equivalent of express advocacy. Second point is that there has long been an exemption recognized in constitutional law for groups that face substantial risk of threats, harassments, or reprisals as a result of disclosure. This goes back to the 1950s in NAACP v. Alabama Supreme Court decision. But there the bar is you have to show some evidence of a reasonable threat, reasonable probability of threats, harassments, or reprisals. The court most recently considered this exemption in the Doe v. Reed case. It had to do with disclosure of signatories of ballot measure petitions in the state of Washington. And in that case, again, an eight to one decision, Justice Scalia wrote a concurring opinion. And I rarely have the opportunity to recommend that people read Justice Scalia's opinion. But you should check out the last paragraph of his concurring opinion in Doe v. Reed, where he, to paraphrase that last paragraph, he says, a world without disclosure or a nation without disclosure does not to him sound like the home of the brave. He says, have some civic courage. He uses the phrase civic courage. If you're going to get out there, talk in elections, subject yourself to disclosure. Of course, again, with the caveat that if there's reasonable probability of threats, harassments, or reprisals, you can be exempt. Socialist Workers Party exemption from disclosure was most recently re-upped by the FEC a year ago. They've been exempt from disclosure laws since the 1970s. They're an example. But I guess I'll leave the disclosure piece there if we want to move on to that. If I could ask one follow-up question on that, though. I'm curious, with what happened with Mozilla CEO last week, where he gave a $1,000 contribution to the anti-gay marriage proposition in California back in 2008. It was $1,000. It passed in the state. So he was with the majority of the folks in California. It's since been overturned by the courts. But I'm curious, how do you apply the Socialist Worker Party exemption if you don't know that you're going to be unpopular four years down the road, six years down the road? My view is that in the economic marketplace, employers are fully entitled. I mean, we can talk about whether we should enact laws that prohibit private sector employers from firing people for a variety of reasons. We can have that discussion. I have a feeling that I would probably advocate greater worker protections in that discussion, in the context of that discussion, than would some of my other co-panelists. But today, under the law, I think employers should have the right to make a judgment. If they think continuing to employ someone who is wildly unpopular because of their political beliefs, I don't have a problem with them having a right to do that. Maybe we should pass a law that says employers cannot fire someone who is going to damage the business through their mere presence as an employee of the company or the head of the company, the CEO of the company. But I think that's what went on in Mozilla. I think boycotts are a good exercise of free speech. I think employers have rights to employ the people they want to employ. My question is more that the only reason anyone knew his political position was that he had written the check and it had been disclosed under California's disclosure regime. I don't think there's any suggestion that he's been unfair in his hiring practices or has talked about politics in his job. So isn't he losing his job specifically because his contribution was disclosed? 
I think he's losing his job because of his political positions and the fact that they have become widely known and his employer, the board of directors of Mozilla, views that as damaging to their business. That's why I think he's losing his job. Um, you know, and that's one of the purposes, and it's Justice Scalia, as well as eight members of the court in, in Citizens United, said public disclosure gives voters and consumers and shareholders the ability to hold people accountable for their politics. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we can have, I'm very open to a discussion of where thresholds should be for disclosure. I think there are some jurisdictions out there that probably have thresholds for disclosure that are too low. Um, but that's a separate question from whether we should have disclosure or whether we should scrap disclosure because some people get involved in politics, spend money in the political arena, and then are held to account for those views by their employers, by a board of directors, by others. Well, it does seem to me that it, it goes to my point, which is that what has become increasingly apparent is that the, this transparency really does become a witch hunt for targets uh, to attack and belittle and malign people with whom uh, certain groups disagree. And it's been particularly true with regard to those who contributed to the traditional marriage uh, supporters of Prop 8, and there are many instances where this was, uh, there were many instances where people would give $100, I think the threshold in California is $100, and people uh, were subjected to all kinds of abuse, and I think that that's really, I think that is problematic. I think that, and I don't think that when they were talking about holding people accountable, I don't think they were talking about holding donors accountable. I think the court was talking about holding public officials accountable. And I, and I do think that what, and you know, I just think that this uh, quest for disclosing everything is almost a voyeurism. And, um, it, and I think that, that it's time that we have a legitimate debate. And look, I listened to, I was at the four arguments in Delby Reed, and I listened to Justice Scalia, who I admire very much. However, I just think he's wrong on this. And I heard him say from the thunder from the bench, you know, taking a Running a democracy requires a certain amount of civic courage, you know, and he's, you know, well, that's easy for him to say, you know, but, I mean, he's in his cloistered position, but, you know, I do think that this raises all kinds of very troubling concerns, and like I say, you know, transparency and disclosure, it sounds good, but when it's used as a weapon, it just reminds me that box cutters are a, a very uh, useful household tool until they're used to bring down airplanes and fly them into buildings. And sometimes things that sound good and seem harmless are in fact not. I just think that you're right that there are incidents where people are getting harassed for this. But as I think about the um, amount of similar harassment that goes on in every sphere, whether you're talking about union organizing where you've got fights around card check and whether or not people who are trying to organize as they are legitimately allowed to under existing labor law and are getting harassed for their union organizing, or people who are many of my clients who are doing really grassroots community organizing on landlord-tenant issues, on um, other economic justice issues, on environmental justice issues, are getting significantly harassed for their public engagement. I think that having a reasonable threshold of donor disclosure is probably a good balancing between the threat of occasional harassment and the legitimate public interest in knowing who's behind the people who are setting our policies. I want to um, get uh, you know, one question. No, go ahead. Sorry. Right. I want to throw out a proposal um, that I've actually written about before, but I'm going to offer this up right, particularly for Clea and Paul. I'm curious to kind of get a thumbs up or thumbs down on an alternate kind of outside-the-box solution. Any group that wants to pay for any kind of communication, including explicit express advocacy, down to any communication that even mentions an officer or a candidate, can set up a, a labeled dark money account. You can give a contribution to our dark money account, and we can use those dollars to pay for literally any communication, but we will never disclose that amount of money to anybody. And if you can't tell anybody either, the donor can't go to public officials and say, hey, that's my $10 million. If you do, you waive the confidentiality of the account and disclose that donor for the general public. It builds on John's point, really, about that expectation of privacy. If you're the Mozilla CEO, you have any reason to think that maybe you don't want to be held accountable 
for your financial political expression, you do it in a way that you're truly anonymous. You're not just privately anonymous to the public, but you get the leverage over the official. You're truly anonymous. And I'm curious to see, what I've heard in the past is, each side has told me, I kind of like the idea, but the other guys would never go for it. And I'm curious to get a sense of whether either your camps, whatever you want to call them, um, would see this as a non-star. Well, you know, it's, it's similar. What you're describing is something like uh, what is available with 501c3 organizations in terms of a donor advice fund, where they get, where the donor advice fund gives the money to the 501c3 and never knows the, the c3 doesn't know. They just, they don't know who gave the money, who the actual source, the ultimate source of the money is. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think that we ought to, I think that it's worth considering. I, I mean, I sort of think that we ought to think, rethink the idea of what I, what I said, to, that everything has to be disclosed. And go back to the time, remember our constitutional convention was conducted in secret. And but secret, I, uh, secret, as to the people in the room, right. nobody was going outside saying, by the way, it's us, right. but please don't tell right. John, Paul, or somebody else. But I mean, the, the, the whole idea is, you know, that there was a time in our country, and important times in our country, where anonymous uh, communications and secrecy uh, had a value, and I think we ought to think about that. Um, I think it's a really interesting idea. There's a step in that direction that was articulated in the form of an op-ed within the last few days by Professor Heather Gerken, who didn't suggest going that far, but said, hey, if we're going to have this dark money in the process, let's require a requirement that groups who are not disclosing their donors put on the face of their ad paid for by a group that doesn't disclose its donors, something to that effect. Um, I think there could be enforcement challenges to the system that you envision, but I'd, be, I'd love to see it on paper and to scrutinize, as lawyers do, the actual language of the particularly disclose or the enforcement mechanism that's in place. One thing that also strikes me, though, is that it only addresses one of the two governmental interests that the Supreme Court has repeatedly recognized as being served by disclosure. One is preventing corruption, and your idea directly goes to that. And I, you know, it's a very creative and interesting way to get at that. But another thing the Supreme Court has said over and over again is voters have a right to know who is paying for elections. Um, so I would need to give it more thought and how it doesn't meet that governmental interest that's been recognized by the court and whether and maybe it's the case that that governmental interest is driven principally by corruption concerns, but I would have to look more closely at the case law on that. Um, but that's one concern I have that only addresses one of the two relevant governmental interests. I think it's not particularly workable, and I'll mention Heather Gerken's interesting proposal as well. The donor advice fund example is exactly the right analogy. I'll tell you what, my clients get a lot of money from donor advice funds, and they know in every case who the donor was who recommended that the donor, in almost every case, who the donor was that recommended who give them that, who that grant came to. And that's going to happen with politicians and parties as well that get money through this secret, blind trust of an idea. And how are you going to enforce it when at a cocktail party somewhere it's me? Um, there'll be five people claiming credit for the same hundred. Well, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think just, you know, to the extent it's actually approved, you have a violation. You have yeah. an enforcement process is pretty much the only one that kind of, of disclosure outside the agreement. I have a similar problem with Heather Gerken's idea, which was interesting, which was you either disclose or you brand your ad saying non-disclosed money ran this ad or something to that effect. And... Um, if I'm the person under that regime, I'm going to get all my contributions from Americans for America who got all of its money from Americans for Justice who got all of its money from Americans for Truth who got all of its money from Americans. We can keep this up all night. So, yeah. One of the things that we talked about a little bit is that the C4, there's a limit on how much political activity it can engage in. Paul, what's sort of the general rule for that now and, and, and how do we figure that out? If the group that level. Well, there's quite a bit of slippage between the statute and what is the practice today for C4. So the statute has been on the books for many, many decades, requires that C4s operate exclusively for the promotion of social welfare. And there is IRS regulatory guidance that makes clear that campaign activity does not constitute promotion of social welfare. 
But there's also IRS guidance in the form of regulations that say that C4s may engage, in, or I'll rephrase this, what the IRS regulation says is that you can claim C4 status so long as you are primarily engaged in promotion of the social welfare, or the public good and the general welfare, is I think the language they use in the regulation. And the flip side of that, you're eligible as long as you are primarily engaged in doing social welfare stuff, is that you can do some candidate election intervention so long as it is not your primary activity, which is how CLETA accurately described it at the outset. That's kind of the test now. You can do C4, C4s can do political campaign intervention as long as it's not their primary activity. Um, I was part of the legal team representing Representative Chris Van Hollen suing the IRS over this regulation and we, um, under the Administrative Procedures Act, saying the statute says exclusively there's no way 49.9%, which is how some tax lawyers advise their clients primary should be read. Um, some more uh, conservative tax lawyers would tell their clients to stand or 40% or so to be on the safe side. But basically people have said, I know what primary means. It means more than 50%. Um, and we dropped that lawsuit because the remedy we were seeking was a rulemaking proceeding to revisit this, these regulations uh, that say C4s can do candidate election activity as long as it's not their primary activity. We dropped the lawsuit when the IRS issued its notice of proposed rulemaking that we're here to discuss tonight because, um, you know, without prejudice, and we reserve the right to bring the lawsuit again at the end of this thing if the IRS does nothing on this point. But I think that's where the law is today. I'll let the tax lawyer clarify if I've... Uh, no, I, I can take it your lawsuit, but I won't bother. <laughs> John, one of the things that um, has been an issue, I think, is, is trying to figure out how to count political activity. Yeah. Um, you, um, adopt, you, you've put, been involved in a project that's put forth some proposals on that. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, one of the problems with the current regime, as described by both Paul and Clea, is that... Um, one, we have this ambiguity about how much is allowed for 501c4s. And two, we don't even know what it is that we're supposed to count to whatever that limit is. And a number of years ago, well, for 20 plus years, those of us who practice in this area have been complaining about this and said, please, IRS, issue some guidance. Please, IRS, do some sort of rulemaking with Treasury to define what it is you mean when you say political activity, whether that's in the context of political activity by 501c3s, which they are not allowed to do, campaign intervention, or the 501c4 social welfare versus other stuff limits, and with the other stuff including the political activity, or for that matter, the 501c6 um, business associations like the Chamber of Commerce or the 501c5 unions like the AFFL, um, what is it that is this political activity? Well, after beating our heads against the wall with the IRS and Treasury and not really getting very far, we finally said, you're smart tax lawyers. Let's see if we can come up with a proposed definition that provides at least some clarity uh, f for the regulated community, for the regulators, We'll talk about the scandal where it seems that the IRS can't even figure out what is political activity. Um, and frankly, makes it possible for people to stop paying us so much money so that they can figure it out for themselves. And we took as our model something that the IRS successfully did uh, with congressional impetus uh, around the lobbying arena. We had a similar problem in the 1970s. We didn't know how much, what lobbying was. And Congress, in 1976, passes a new law that defines a certain mathematical threshold for how much lobbying a 501c3 could do and defined in broad terms what that lobbying was and then left it to the IRS to flush out in regulations. And after a failed first draft, they came back with the help of the regulated community. We all sat down around a big table with the IRS and developed really good regulations that frankly have solved most of the problems. And now, you don't pay as much to lawyers to figure out, am I lobbying or not? Yeah, there's some edge cases, but by and large, that's answered. So what became known as the Bright Lines Project was formed uh, by Greg Colvin of San Francisco's Adler and Colvin, and a bunch of us who practice in this area all around the country serving as the drafting committee. And we put together a proposal that is the definition, as we'd like to see it, of what constitutes political activity. 
not just for 501c4s, but also for C3s and for other exempt organizations, and also for business organizations, um, so that when you know you're not allowed to deduct expenditures for political activity out of your business corporation, you know what it is you're not allowed to deduct. What we took as our model, again, was the lobby rules. And like that, we deci decided there should be a sphere that constitutes clearly political activity, a threshold beyond that where, yeah, it might be political activity, and then a set of safe harbors that define, even though you cross that threshold, it's not political activity if you're doing these things. So just briefly to summarize a, a long proposal that you can find on the Bright Lines Project website. Um, if you're endorsing a candidate or political party, you're engaged in political activity. If you're contributing to a candidate or a political party or a PAC, you're engaged in political activity. And if you're setting up a litmus test that voters are supposed to use to determine whether or not they vote for somebody, then you're engaged in political activity. So if you're saying vote pro-choice or vote pro-life, then you're engaged in political activity. But that's the easy stuff. We all kind of knew that was political activity. Beyond that, we set up a threshold bar. If you are referring to a candidate and expressing a view on that candidate, we need to inquire further. You might be, you might be already be a winner. You might have engaged in political activity. But we carved out some safe harbors for things that we think are important enough to protect. Number one is legitimate advocacy on current issues that are before the lawmakers. So if a sitting member of Congress is running for re-election, you shouldn't be banned from engaging in grassroots lobbying that says, Congressman so-and-so is an idiot for supporting House Bill number 123. Contact Congressman so-and-so and tell him to stop it. You should be allowed to engage in this clear First Amendment protected speech on policy issues that are before them. Nonpartisan voter education is our second safe harbor. If you want to put out a voter guide that lays out where the candidates stand on the issues of importance to you, and indeed, even if in that voter guide you want to say, here's where we stand on the issue, we think that's important enough to a functioning democracy that it ought to be protected and not categorized as political activity prohibited to C3s, limited for others. Um, we also have what we call the self-defense exception. If you're the ACLU, to take an example, and a presidential candidate decides to attack his opponent by, for being a card-carrying member of the ACLU, the ACLU ought to be able to speak up and say, that's not so bad. It, we do good stuff at the ACLU. We let, you know, let us talk. Or if a, uh, a candidate for office says something about the issue that is the heart and soul of your organization, if you are the National Right to Life Committee and a candidate says something inane about um, uh, uh, reproductive rights, um, the National Right to Life Committee, which always talks about policy issues around reproductive rights, ought to be able to respond to that candidate in kind. So that's the safe harbor for self-defense. And then finally, we've carved out what I like to think of as the, the pulpit exception or the board meeting exception. Um, if you're in a room like this with a bunch of people, without a camera like that, Hi. and you're just talking, if you are sitting on the bima of your mosque, or if you are standing, please, at, or if you are um, at um, a meeting of your local environmental club, you should be able to say, God, these candidates are terrible on our issues, or you know, really, according to our ideology, this is not somebody that you should be looking at for life. You should be allowed to say that. I'm not giving you permission to then put it up on YouTube and start promoting it on your Facebook page. Like her. Um, but that ought to be protected. So that's the safe harbors. Beyond that, there's a limited regime left for what the current situation is, which is the facts and circumstances situation. If all of that rule that I just created for you doesn't answer your question, then yes, you need to convince the IRS or the IRS needs to convince you that it is or isn't political activity based on what you said, when you said it, who you targeted it to, all of those facts and circumstances. But that's going to leave only just a small quantum of what is now a huge sphere of unanswered questions to define what is or isn't political activity. And we think that's a good thing, just like it was in the lobbying room. 
Maybe that sounds like a lot more pages of regulation. <coughs> Normally, you would have to say no. What, what are your thoughts on something like that? Well, I mean, John and I talked about this uh, and a lot, actually. And um, I would I would create more safe harbors. Um, and, you know, look, I mean, I, I would actually, I'm a Buckley girl. I mean, I would go back to Buckley versus Vallejo, in which the court said in 1976 that, uh, under the First Amendment, citizens have the right to know in advance which uh, speech is going to be subject to government regulation and which speech is not. And the only way to do that is to draw bright lines and to say, if you go across this line, then you, I mean, the real bright line, which is that if you, if you engage in speech which by its expressed terms encourages a s support or opposition to a candidate, Using, using words like, and that's where the magic words comes from, that's, uh, that's where express advocacy comes from, is that discussion in uh, Buckley, which says, you know, using words such as vote for, vote against, support, oppose, elect, defeat. And I, I would make it simple, and I, would, I agree with the court, people have a right to know in advance. I think, I applaud what John and his colleagues have been doing, because it does raise the point that bright lines are required under the First Amendment. And so while we can maybe have some differences about, you know, I would put more things on the side of not being regulated, but, you know, I think that I, you know, I, I certainly applaud the fact that they're at least talking in, in the right terms, which is in the right terminology. Because I don't think the government should, I mean, look, I mean, I, I quote George Will about what is so hard about what George Will calls the five most beautiful words in the English language. The first five words of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law. Now that's not a very difficult standard, and yet we have really muddied that, and we make a lot of law that I think is uh, constitutionally problematic, and you just can't spend the time challenging everything. But can I talk just briefly about the constitutional issue? This, this isn't news to plead because we do talk a lot about this. Um, but um, you're a Buckley boy. I'm kind of a Buckley boy. I kind of like Buckley. I, um, I like the First Amendment. Yeah. Maybe we can get a little song and dance together. Um, Busby Buckley. Um, but it's different in the scope of exempt organizations. The Supreme Court has spoken to this, most importantly in Regan versus taxation with, represent with representation of Washington. Um, and there it says, this is not pure First Amendment land where we're just talking about people sort of rising up from the grassroots and speaking their mind. This is a group that has made a bargain that says we want to be exempt from tax. We would like to have, in the case of a 501c3, the ability to offer our donors a tax deduction uh, or get more money from private foundations in a tax advantaged way. Even 501c4s and 5s and 6s have tax advantages in that they don't pay income tax. What Regan said is in exchange for that, you've got to accept the rules that come with that status. And we, the Supreme Court has said, we're not bound by the First Amendment in the way we are in the campaign finance sphere. We are allowed to look at whether or not Congress can set requirements for tax-exempt status that include restrictions on political speech or on lobbying or on other activities, private benefit or private inurement, for example. Now, at some point they go too far, and there's a fight to be had there, but right now, we talked about in the Bright Lines Project, coming up with a sort of Buckley-esque magic words thing, we think this passes constitutional muster, and we'd love to have a chance to fight it out in the Supreme Court and find out. Um, well, I want to add a few remarks along the same lines, and I agree with John, things are different when you're talking about tax status versus um, prohibitions on speech or direct restrictions on speech. In my view, this IRS, the pending rulemaking, the issues that have drawn a lot of attention in the last few years around uh, the IRS and C4 groups and other tax exempt groups, they're not about whether or not you can do A or B or C. They're whether or not you have chosen the correct tax exempt status to do A, B or C. As I mentioned, near the beginning of the hour that there is a tax exempt status for groups that are 100% dedicated to express candidate advocacy. It's section 527. Why don't groups want to claim that tax exempt status? Because they have to disclose their donors. And that's why I think it's, you know, it's very appropriate that Ron sort of began our discussion around disclosure because 
The IRS isn't doing this, in my view, because it cares about disclosure per se. I think the IRS's job is to say, we have these different boxes for tax exempt status. It's the IRS's job to make sure that you are putting yourself in the right box and staying in the, within the confines of the box that you have chosen for yourself. I, as a um, you know, employee of the Campaign Legal Center, I care about disclosure. I care about the IRS's rulemaking in large part because of disclosure, but that's different than the IRS being into this because of disclosure. And, and my response is, you know, you can do, say anything you want through a 527 group and you're going to have to disclose your donors. One brief remark about Buckley and the express advocacy test. We had a couple decades of running politics under that express advocacy test and in 2003, five members of the U.S. Supreme Court in McConnell v. FEC referred to that test as, quote, functionally meaningless, close quote. Why? Because they had seen that over the course of a couple of decades, political operatives realized how very easy it is to get around that express advocacy test. You just stop short of saying vote for or vote against. You say, Bill Yellowtail beats his wife. Tell Congressman Yellowtail why you don't like wife beaters. Run that on TV in his state in the weeks leading up to his election. That's just as good as vote against Bill Yellowtail. The Supreme Court recognized that, but we've had a change in composition of the court, so we've had a change in the interpretation of what the First Amendment allows and disallows. But um, the IRS in this NPRM has included, well, I'll take one step back. In McConnell, the court, in declaring that the express advocacy test was functionally meaningless, it did so in the context of upholding the electioneering communications test that I had mentioned earlier in our hour, where the, where the, the law is if you mention a candidate in close proximity to an election under federal law on TV or radio, you're covered by the disclosure rules. The IRS took a very similar approach, but the Campaign Legal Center, we think the IRS went too far in the NPRM because as John has suggested, John and I, I think, agree on this, the IRS shouldn't be regulating speech in a meeting of a 501c4 or any other group, groups that want to say, I think this candidate's horrible on this issue. That shouldn't trigger. Um, IRS scrutiny, I don't think. So we've advocated in the context of the NPRM that the IRS step back, take a few steps back, and to instead regulate what is something along the lines of the Federal Election Commission's definition of public communication that gets at spending money to communicate with members of the public. Um, so there, there are some very distinct ways in which the Campaign Legal Center thinks the IRS in this proposal is going too far. We're often painted as we want to push the IRS even further. We have some problems with the IRS and PRM, and some of them are those highlighted by John already. John, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the IRS's proposed rules? We'll talk about the IRS controversy in, in a few minutes that sort of led up to all this, but I want to I think we're in a good pivot here. Of how did the IRS, what has the IRS done? How does it go further than the Bright Lines Project? That seemed like an imminently reasonable starting point, but that's not where the IRS is. Oh, put started. you down as a support. Um, <laughs> uh, just well, depending on how you count, before or just after, during Thanksgiving week, um, the uh, Treasury Department issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, which we are now going to call forever an NPRM, now that you've got the jargon. Um, and in it, the um, Department of Treasury offered draft definitions of what constitute political activity for C4s. They created a new term of art, Candidate-related political activity. Please make sure you get those initials right before coming up with an acronym, please. Um, they also um, asked the question but did not suggest um, as to whether or not this uh, definition should apply to other 501Cs, although they acknowledged that it was probably not the right one for 501C3s. Um, and they asked the question but didn't opine how much of this stuff should groups be allowed to do, 501C4s be allowed to do. The interesting thing about the definition is that they went in a really different direction than the Bright Lines Project, or indeed the existing facts and circumstances, Lucy goosey unconstitutionally vague standard. Um, what they did was they cast a very, very broad net, defining, I would argue, almost anything that you could possibly conceive of as political activity, with a few really glaring exceptions, um, as political. And I'll just run through very briefly um, what definitions they propose for candidate-related political activity. Um, any communication expressing a view on the selection, nomination, election, or appointment of a clearly identified candidate or of candidates for a particular political party, either via express words 
or other means that are susceptible of no reasonable interpretation other than a call to support or oppose the candidates. Um, you'll recognize that language is coming from the federal election regulations for what constitutes express advocacy. This is, by the way, not the first time that the IRS in this rulemaking looked to the FEC regs. There's a lot of that going on, as you'll see. Uh, I'll also note that kind of out of the blue, although there is some connection to the current statute in 527, um, they included not just candidates for elected office, but also candidates for appointed office. Um, so this sort of express advocacy for or against a nominee for the cabinet would suddenly become electioneering or candidate-related political activity. Uh, other stuff that they think is candidate-related political activity. Any public communication, another FEC term that they kind of expanded to include TV, radio, periodicals, phone banks, internet, um, referring to a clearly identified candidate within 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general election, referring to a political party, or referring to a political party within 60 days of a general election. That 30, 60 days should already echo the thing that Paul was talking about around electioneering communications. That's where that came from. Other candidate-related political activity. Communications for which expenditures are reported to the Federal Election Commission. So that would include the reporting of express advocacy, the reporting of electioneering communications. It might include reporting of membership communications and other stuff, but we're not really sure about that. Um, contributions, or, contributions to or solicitation of contributions on behalf of candidates for elective office for any political organization exempt under Section 527. Um, uh, or any 501c organization that engages in candidate-related political activity. Now, that's kind of a big one, because if you give your C 501c gives money to another 501c that engages in the stuff that I've been talking about, all of a sudden your contribution to them, no matter how constrained and how cabined, becomes a political act by your organization. They offer what purported to be an exception, which is um, you get some sort of certification from them that you don't engage, the recipient organization doesn't engage in candidate-related political activities and that the contribution won't be used for such activities. But what that effectively means is if you give a buck to an organization that engages in this very broadly defined category of electioneering, your dollar is a political expenditure. So that was big. And then just briefly, the rest of them, if you do any voter registration or any get-out-the-vote work, it's candidate-related political activity. If you do any voter guide describing to the voters, no matter how nonpartisan, um, uh, where the candidates stand on the issues, it's political activity. Or, and I love this one, holding or conducting an event within 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general election, you recognize those times, um, in which one or more of the candidates in such election appears as part of the program. So if you want to have a ribbon cutting for your new fancy building here at GW, and you invite one of the candidates who happens to be running for mayor here in Washington, you've just engaged in political activity, and all of the cost of that pizza becomes a political expenditure. So that's the big thing. Now, Remember, they're doing this in the context of 5.1c4s, and as Paul points out, 5.1c4s, it's not about forbidding them from doing it. It's about sort of defining what the sphere of stuff you have to count is in terms of whether it's primary purpose eligible or not. And that's, I think, where they're at. But I, I, I think of the 140-some thousand, I think they're actually up to 150 now, yeah, um, Comments. I would be shocked if there was a single one of them that said, these are good, good definitions. Yeah. Everybody from the groups that favor more stringent regulation of campaign finance mm -hmm. to pure libertarian Buckley girl um, and boy uh, people think these are really bad <laughs> definitions. And I think like they did in the lobby um, arena, Treasury and the IRS is going to have to go back to the drawing board, ideally sitting down with people at this table and others to come up with a better definition and try again. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that I would say is, I mean, I, I, I could and, and have spent hours and hours talking about all the deficiencies and, and horrible uh, features of these proposed regulations. I mean, 
In fact, I wrote a whole, I spent one Sunday afternoon writing scenarios of the different kinds of things that these uh, regulations would uh, treat as candidate-related political activity. And, you know, there are lots of real problems with it. I think one of the things that is most problematic to me, I'm a pro, in addition to being a black girl, I'm a process person. And I really believe that, you know, that the IRS should be subject to the same procedural requirements as uh, other federal agencies for purposes of rulemaking. I know the IRS has argued in court uh, on uh, many occasions that it's, it's really not subject to things like the Administrative Procedures Act and such other pesky little statutes. And, um, you know, there, so some of us filed uh, comments not only with the IRS opposing the regulations, but also with OMB. Um, pointing out the procedural defects in the way the IRS went about promulgating uh, or issuing this notice of proposed rulemaking. They did it off plan. You know, the a agencies are supposed to issue their plans for how, what the rules are that they're contemplating. They deliberately did this off plan so that nobody knew until Tuesday before Thanksgiving that they were going to do it and then it was issued on Friday after Thanksgiving, Black Friday. And um, and I think that one of the things that's quite bothersome, uh, on behalf of one client, we filed a FOIA request in December seeking the uh, internal documents for uh, the information about where this came from. What kind of, I know, I, we now know there was some kind of internal task force. We know that, but you know, we don't have the documents. They came back and they were supposed to provide those by January the 10th. They came back and said we need more time on January 28th. Then they came back on January 28th and said, we'll get you the documents by April 7th, which is this week. I just got a letter from them yesterday saying, we'll get you the uh, documents uh, in July. And I called the IRS person and I said, is July 2nd a real date? Or she said, well, no, I just kind of picked that. <laughs> and I said, um, have you heard anything? She said, no, I sent out all the things about the, what they're supposed to do. And I haven't heard anything since. That was in December. So now, of course, what do we have to do? We have to sue them. But the thing that's most troubling about that is that on the web page, the official web page of the IRS, uh, of regulations.gov, where these proposed regulations are published, where people can make comments, one of the things that there's a feature there where um, they are supposed to include documents that give more information and background to the uh, development of the regulations. And under that, uh, heading where it says documents, it says none. Now, it's taken an awful long time for the IRS and Treasury to, to get me the none documents. So, you know, and I, you know, we could talk whenever you want to about, you know, what's been going on with the IRS in the last several years, but um, I just think that there, I think that, I don't think there's any doubt that the IRS and the leadership of the IRS and exempt organizations, uh, that they were engaged for whatever reason, because, that, because of all the letters that they were getting from members of Congress, Democratic members of Congress, to go after conservative groups, whether it was the president's speeches all over the country attacking Citizens United and saying, you know, these dark money groups and all the attacks. I don't know. Well, what I do know, because I live with it, because I represent a lot of the people in the groups that were uh, subjected to it, um, is that there is a, there is a real po political agenda to try to silence um, certain um, groups and to try to, you know, to watch them and to try to figure that they were somehow perceived to be doing things that maybe we didn't want them to do and we're going to have to figure out how to stop them. And these re the regulations mirror a lot of the questions that the groups received. It's very burdensome. One of my clients, uh, after waiting for two and a half years, for some word from the IRS after filing their C4 or C3 status, got questionnaires that included over 100 questions, which, you know, is insanity. But, uh, you know, then four days after the end of the comment period for these regulations, guess what the IRS did? In a newsletter to exempt, uh, exempt organizations, 4.55 p.m., March the 4th, 2014, Buried down, in, and the only reason I think I saw it was because I woke up at 3 in the morning worried about a client, and so I started going through emails that I hadn't seen because um, I'd been out in meetings with this crazy client the day before. And so I'm up at 3 in the morning. You guys are in law school, right? Welcome to our world. But, um, <laughs> but so I start reading this newsletter, and buried down in this newsletter is 
From now on, all applicants for C4 status can be guaranteed to get all the questions that the TIFRA agreements come. All of the phrases. That is not what that says. That is what that says. If you are pursuing and engaged in advocacy, then you're going to get all of those questions. So I actually think it would be malpractice for anybody to ever submit a 1024 for a 501c4 advocacy group. Because it implicit in the guidance is that they're not going to grant C4 status until you have waited, until you've been subjected to a two to three year waiting period, because you're going to have to tell the IRS all of these things that you've done before they're going to give you, before they're going to process your application. But it's a pretty, I don't think the IRS has acted in good faith. That's my, you know, that's the nicest thing I can say. Apparently, Chairman Ice of the House Oversight Committee doesn't think so either. Given that he referred, the committee voted to refer the former head of the Exempt Organizations Division to the Justice Department, and they're probably going to find her in contempt tomorrow for not answering their questions. Take us back a little bit. What has the IRS been doing? What's precipitated this? And I'll give you guys a chance to comment on that. Well, I'll give you this example. Is that, you know, before this, before the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, I mean, I went back and looked at sort of all my files going back, just not all of them, but just looking at lists of how long it had taken historically for the IRS to process an application for C-4 status. And, you know, sometimes it would take three weeks, sometimes it would take a month, four or five weeks, but it didn't take a long time for C-4 status. It took a little longer for C-3 applications, but not, you know, not for C-4s. And I had an application for a group that I filed in October of 2009, and the IRS accepted the application, cashed our check, and because you'd have to pay for this process. And then we didn't hear anything. You know, and I realized I kept getting the client saying, what, it's a C-4 application. And the first time we heard from the IRS was June of 2010, so now we're from October to June. And what the IRS asked for were all of the TV ads that this organization had run against Obamacare, because that actually was about the only thing that was all they had done. They had not done, they really were only involved in trying to stop Obamacare. They ran ads that were legitimate, grassroots lobbying, call your congressman, your congressman. They ran them in districts around the country. That organization, you know, I fought with the IRS for several years. I never heard from Cincinnati with regard to that client. I only heard from Washington. I had multiple conversations, letters, communications. They finally got their C-4 status in July of last year. And meanwhile, then I start having other clients. We apply for different things, some C-3, mostly C-4. And I was told by one organization, I didn't file the original application. One of the things that I think is really, has been completely misconstrued, most of these Tea Party organizations are, they're mom and pop groups. Most of them didn't have lawyers applying, you know, filling out their applications. You know, there is a form on the IRS website you fill out. It tells you the checklist. It tells you what you're supposed to do. And, you know, these are not, I mean, the average, I would say one of my clients is kind of an umbrella for a lot of, a coordinator for a lot of different Tea Party groups. And she sent out a questionnaire last summer to about 400 or 500 of the Tea Party groups asking what their annual budget was. They were just like, they were running ads. The average was like, their annual budget was less than $5,000. I mean, these are, and guess what the things they did? They did such nefarious things as having candidate forums and having candidate debates and registering people to vote. And that is a lot of the activity in which they engaged. And it is, in my view, that is social welfare activity. That is for the common good. I mean, would we rather, and these proposed regulations would make a candidate debate, they would call that a, that's a candidate related political activity. Can't count towards your primary purpose. I mean, would we rather have people 
just get their information from 30 second ads. I thought that we didn't, I thought we wanted people to be more engaged and go to meetings and ask candidates questions. Um, but, you know, that I, I was told in the fall of 2011 when I, sub, I called the uh, agent in Cincinnati who was assigned to this one client, had been now waiting for two years, no, year and a half. And I said, you know, we're going to supplement this application and we'll be sending that to you in a couple of weeks or so I introduce myself. He said, well, you can send it to me, but there's a task force. There, there are people in Washington. I've got, I'll have to forward it to them. I go, okay, so I send the letter, send the supplement. In early November, in December, I called back just before Christmas and said, hey, did you get our package? Did you send it on? Have you heard anything? He basically says, lady, we're sitting here waiting. Uh, we can't do anything. We're waiting for Washington to tell us what to do. And the, fact, the, thing, the truth is that Lois Lerner, when she said on May the 10th of last year that this was some rogue agents in Cincinnati, she knew that that was a lie. That was not true. And we now, and now we all know it's true, but I knew it wasn't true because I had these two clients that I talked to the IRS about. And um, one said everything's being done in Washington, and the other group, everything's happening in Washington from the beginning. And we know that the testimony that was given to Congress in the spring of 2012 after the IRS sent these very burdensome letters to hundreds and hundreds of groups. We know that the IRS commissioner told the Congress that there was no targeting. That was not true. We know that the people in the C-suite at the IRS knew, if not that day, certainly within weeks, that that was false testimony. Nothing's ever, nothing's ever happened. And the reason I was late is because I just filed a supplemental ethics complaint against uh, Elijah Cummings on behalf of my client through the vote because it now appears uh, based on emails that were released only within the last month um, that Cummings, Representative Cummings and his staff were, had sought specific information about True the Vote and had told the IRS we're initiating our own investigation of True the Vote. This organization made the mistake of getting involved in voter integrity issues and trying to for people to be involved in poll watching and enforcing the election laws. So, I mean, I just think that there's a lot that we have to think about. I don't think we should have the IRS acting as the enforcer for a, for a political view. And that's what worries me about what's going on. John, what do you think? He thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> he believed that he didn't. He, when I took the things to our meeting, he said, are you guys getting these letters? Well, like, yeah. Well, no, he <laughs> yeah. never got that. Look, so look, let, right, actually, you know, before I even respond to Cleveland, let me just say that on the day where um, Daryl Issa's committee is teeing up a contempt resolution against um, Lois Lerner, that I am personally outraged, and so should all of you be, that this has been a witch hunt against this individual who I had all sorts of problems with how she ran that agency. I had all sorts of problems. But this is not somebody who deserved the hysterical drumbeat of abuse that she has suffered since she put her foot in her mouth on May 10th and said things that were wrong. She hasn't deserved what she's gotten. And I think that it is an outrage that um, uh, certain members of Congress and people on the outside of Congress have decided to make her the poster child of this. And if you're upset about how the Koch brothers are being treated, think about how this individual who has dedicated a lifetime to government service, not government service you may like, is being treated for, at most, bad management. Well, I just disagree. I know you do. Um, but I, I, I just want to go on record that this is really bad what's happening. Um, but let me, let me talk, having said that, let me say that your clients and a lot of other organizations were treated abysmally and really suffered injury at the hands of what happened at the IRS. And let's spread a little blame here. First of all, it is true that there were some liberal and progressive groups that were caught up in this mix, but by and large, the targeting that was done of C3 and C4 organizations originally initiated by perhaps rogue agents in Cincinnati, was done using criteria that were going inevitably to get more conservative groups than liberal groups. And that's really bad. 
and the questions that they were asked and the delays that they suffered did real harm to these organizations as they were twisting in the wind waiting for a, an IRS ruling that many should have gotten, but not all of them. Um, and when the staff in Cincinnati, which is where the IRS determinations function is headquartered, asked Washington for help in 2010, that information was not forthcoming. They didn't get the guidance they were asked for. They were asking for in terms of what is this political stuff and how much of it can these groups do? How can we evaluate these organizations' application for recognition of their tax-exempt status unless we know this stuff? And Washington didn't give it to them, in part because there aren't any good answers. So, yes, there has been a problem with this for years. There have been anecdotal cases. I've had clients who were asked to print out their websites, and I've had clients that were asked, what do you mean by progressive when you say you're going to work on progressive issues? Could you detail that for me? And all sorts of other entirely inappropriate questions. I had a client that I did pro bono that was told, well, you're having a conference. Um, you really are not allowed to put a link to the hotel where your conference is on your website, although you can have a non-clickable URL to that hotel. I said, what? what? Could you cite me the regulation for that, please? <laughs> so look, there's all sorts of abuse and horrible stuff that's happened to these folks, and we need to fix it. And right now, the conservative groups were targeted as part of these be on the lookout bolo lists, really got the short end of the stick uh, on this stuff. But it's a big problem, and it needs to get fixed. We'll let Paul have um, thoughts there, and then we'll open it up for questions from anybody in the audience. And I share John's views with respect to Lois Lerner. Um, I've known her for years. I have no sort of personal relationship with her. I've known her professionally. And I have been frustrated by inaction by the IRS in 2010, 2011, 2012. How many of you have seen the House Ways and Means Committee letter that we published this afternoon? I know a bunch of you are probably in class today. But this has been referenced a couple times in the last few minutes. I'm calling for a criminal investigation for multiple criminal violations of federal law by Lois Lerner, the former head of exempt organizations there, and featured prominently at the beginning of this letter is a series of letters that my organization, the Campaign Legal Center, together with Democracy 21, sent to the IRS, um, and a meeting that we had with Lois Lerner and other staff, the IRS and Treasury Department. And one, of, one thing that's implied in this House Ways and Means letter is that in that meeting, Lois Lerner may have illegally disclosed confidential taxpayer information to us. Um, there's no basis for that other than that we met with her. And I'll tell you what, we left that meeting frustrated, going, she didn't tell us a thing. She hasn't given us a single bit of information about what the IRS is currently doing or what they plan to do about what we viewed as a huge problem. And nothing was disclosed, let alone confidential taxpayer information. It's, it's an outrageous um, implication to make in this letter from House Ways and Means. On top of all this, this letter today relies on the fact that we filed an initial complaint back in 2010 against a Democratic-leaning group, Priorities USA, and a Republican group, Crossroads GPS, as evidence that the IRS should have given equal scrutiny to those two organizations. It's implied, strongly implied in this letter. The reality is when we filed that letter back in 2010, um, there was a lot of press around the fact that both the Democrats and the Republicans, in the wake of Citizens United and in the wake of a district DC, I'm sorry, a DC Circuit Court decision that gave birth to super PACs, both Dems and Republicans were setting up both sister organizations. On the right, it was American Crossroads Super PAC, Crossroads GPS C4. On the left, it was Priorities USA Action and Priorities USA. And their talking points were essentially, if you don't want to be disclosed, cut your check to the C4, and if you're willing to be disclosed, cut your check to the super PAC. That's what the press was covering. That's what we filed a complaint about. Well, as it turns out, the Democrat-leaning C4 group didn't really do much of anything. It didn't raise much money. It didn't spend much money. Crossroads GPS, by contrast, in the 2010 cycle, raised and spent over $16 million on reportable federal election ads alone, and in 2012, over $70 million. So it's really apples and oranges. It's no wonder, I'll put it this way, it's no wonder that the IRS looked closely at a group spending tens of millions of dollars on ads that we believed put them in violation of their tax status and also violated federal campaign finance law versus a group that we feared going in was going to do the same thing, but it turns out didn't really do it. The Democrats decided seemingly to do 
most of their activity through the super PAC. Right. I mean, they didn't raise the money. So, yeah. so this letter implies that, oh, Lois Lerner, Lois Lerner, Lois Lerner, she went after Crossroads GPS, but she didn't go after Priorities USA, even though the good government groups complained about both. That's exhibit A for why she, how she has broken federal law. And I just don't think the facts back it up. And it's, it's really frustrating to have our material sent to the IRS relied on as some sort of evidence to that effect. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from all of you because I, I could go on and on about this ways and means thing and, and the IRS scandal. Hi, I'm I was an attorney at the Federal Election Commission this yes, year. And I'm a close person. I'm a little slimer. I've worked on about 18 years. Before I ask a question, I want to say this. In my experience with Lois, I have found her, we all pride ourselves on being nonpartisan, and I found her to be very nonpartisan. And I find the allegation that somehow this is a partisan witch hunt to be laughable at best and malicious at worst. Now, in terms of, I think what Paul said is very important that I think no one has discussed <coughs> whether the, it, the, it was the so-called right wing that was engaging more in this activity, marketing more in the new kind of activity, the sequel activity, than the left that has not entered into the discussion of this <coughs> at all. And I, as I said, I find it really laughable that those who target the right over the left I think this is more a matter of where this activity was evident. Well, you know, look, I want to say, uh, I, the letter I'm talking about is a letter that came, that went today from the chairman and the subcommittee chairman of House Oversight to Elijah Cummings, in which, you know, look, they, they had, uh, they've been, both these committees have been conducting, trying to conduct investigations since last May. The IRS did not release Lois Lerner's emails until about four weeks ago. To, so they have not had the benefit. Uh, it seems to me that that's something that should have been, that happened a long time ago. But, and I don't think they have all of them yet. But, um, have you not experienced the federal agency, inside the federal agency, and had to go through the process of releasing emails? This well, is very easy for someone to say, who's Tim, not been in the midst of the federal agency to say, why is this taking so long? There are privacy issues of her own. There are relevance issues of her own. And so to say, oh my God, the IRS is stalling, I think that's not considering what it's like. In fact, one of the problems in this whole witch hunt, that I will call it a witch hunt, is having no idea what goes on inside. And one of Lois's problems, I suspect, I don't know, because I don't talk to her about what her motivations are for taking the fit. But one of the problems I suspect is you have, particularly on the Republican side, such as uh, Jordan of Ohio, are people who want to ask a question, give their own answer, and make just spurious inferences about what goes on in the federal agency. And I don't blame her. This is my own thinking. I don't blame her for taking the fit in front of that panel. And I, and I understand why she would rather, in order to do justice, cooperate with the Justice Department. Well, regardless of whether you think it's a good idea or not, I don't know how you claim that you haven't waived a privilege if you talk to one body that you won't talk to another. There's but, a very conflicting law on but this. Let, the but me, is in favor of allowing the taking of the Fifth Amendment overall. It's a complex issue. I had to explain it is when I was in enforcement at the FEC. And so to say this is that's the issue. She said, I have done nothing wrong. She waived. It's not as easy as that. I don't think it is as easy. But to say, but I also don't see how in the world anyone can expect there to be a full investigation. And they've turned over hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper, but you don't have the communications from the person at the center of the, of the controversy. I, think, I find it deplorable that it's taken 10 months to do that. But I want to share with you that... Um, you guys may say, in your experience, that Lois is fair, nonpartisan. Conservatives don't have that same view, and that goes sure. back. That goes back to the, her behavior in certain cases at the FEC. That was a sense 
when she was at the FEC. But there is a good example is, I mean, and what the committee was upset about today in terms of writing this letter to Representative Cummings is that his staff reached out directly to Lois Lerner's office in August of 2012 and said, we are undertaking an investigation of this organization through the vote, and we want, you know, whatever you can give us about through the vote. And that call came in on a Friday afternoon. The emails are reproduced here. And on Monday, Lois Lerner was saying to her subordinates, have you gotten back to them yet? Have you gotten the information for them yet? And then provided whatever information she could, which is the same thing that happened when Bill Powers from the FEC calls over to Lois at the IRS and says, gee, we want some information about these two groups, one of which was one of my clients, um, because they had applications pending at the IRS. And, you know, I just, look, I mean, contrast that with, I know inside a federal agency, Johnny, but the fact of the matter is she could jump through hoops when she wanted to, and she wasn't <laughs> jumping through hoops to the, for the benefit of this true-the-vote organization that was subjected. You know, we finally had to sue the IRS. We sued the IRS in May of last year. We were already thinking about it, and then went ahead and did it. And then the day before the government's answer was due, they, they, said, they say, oh, well, we've decided to grant True the Vote's uh, C3 status after three years. And now the case is moved. Well, it's not moved. We're still waiting for rulings on other motions. But, you know. I think there's a distinction to be made, by the way, between whether you get sort of preferred responsiveness versus improper documentation. I have seen a lot of people saying that the IRS provided um, uh, inappropriate um, assistance when people asked about organizations, but I've never seen anything substantive that says they didn't, they, they gave, out, gave out anything they weren't supposed to um, in response to such a request. Now, Cleta knows, because we both signed the letter, that there have been mistakes where somehow non-public information did get released. Schedule B's for some of Cleta's clients. Schedule B's where the donors are all listed by name. Uh, of Cleta's clients, um, and in one or two cases, um, as yet unruled upon applications for exempt status. But by and large, and certainly all the lowest correspondence that has been trumpeted in the press, there hasn't been release of um, non-public documentation in response to such requests. As for whether or not she's getting sort of um, you know speedy service. Look, the fact of the matter is, and when you guys go into practice in this area, you're going to find this out, that in the IRS, like with a lot of agencies, yeah, there's a lot of sort of establishing relationships with people in the agency and saying, look, my client's on my back. Could you please give me this information or could you fix this problem that clearly is a mistake? And it gets done. So I'm not that upset about all of that. I will say, in terms of Cummings, staff asking about your client through the vote. As a partner in the firm that represented ACORN groups, let me tell you, congressional groups sort of doing um, over-the-top investigations and saying outrageous things about your client, not to mention privileged documents getting leaked um, by people who shouldn't have been leaking them, it goes both ways. And it shouldn't happen. Um, so I'm Tyler Cole, I've been political outside of here, but I'm a Thank you very much for your time. And you are running over, so thank you for being flexible. I'll try to keep this brief. The two-part question, uh, I guess John is probably answer the first part best. Uh, is it, am I correct in saying that under current rules and regulations, a, a donation from one C4 to a second C4 is not considered political activity? That is an ambiguous, that, that is not clear under current law, but here is how I advise my clients. It could be a political contribution or political expenditure, rather, um, unless you restrict it for some purpose other than that. And um, I, I actually have said in, in quotes to the press that I think that some of the shell game stuff that's been going on, and I think it's happening on the left and the right, um, of one C4 giving to another C4 to another C4 and trying to fulfill their social welfare purpose by saying, well, that grant was social welfare, is not social welfare spending, and they should lose their C4 status. So, uh, the follow-up on this goes to all of you. Other than the proposed rule you mentioned earlier about a donation 
two AC for that conducts political activity, that donation does political activity, which you seem to have a problem with. Yeah. Um, I think current law says that that's questionable. Okay. So other than that, how else would you stop a shell game? I mean, just in general. Well, I, sort of easy I think the easy answer is that any organization that gives to another organization that is capable of doing political activity should be presumed to have made a political expenditure unless they have restricted the use of those funds and have no knowledge that those funds were used in violation of such restrictions. And that's how we do it in the lobbying world. That's actually explicit in the 49-11 regs for C3 lobbying. If you give money to a non-C3 organization, you are presumed to have spent that money on first grassroots lobbying and then direct lobbying. So that's an easy answer. Unless you restrict it to another Unless one of your exempt right. purposes. Yeah, yeah. Is another question here? Is there a way to just uh, take some of this out of the world of the IRS and think the IRS doesn't really want to be in a position of deciding who is doing political activity, and that's why there was you know, so little guidance for so long. Mm -hmm. And there are things that have happened, I think we can see why they don't want to be in that position. Is there a way to go out of there? I'm going to guess that everybody here agrees that the IRS is a lousy agency to regulate campaign finance. Anybody disagree? Well, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And in fact, yeah. if you look at John made reference to this, but yeah, it's almost like they tried to in this in VRM they were trying to mimic uh, the take the electioneering communications yeah. definition. And I think Paul, you may have been one of the people involved in the drafting of that at one point. I don't know, or certainly the campaign legal center, but. You know, there was, whether I agree or disagree, I do think that there was an effort to draw, to craft those regulations and those definitions in mccain fine mode fairly narrowly. Uh, radio and TV only. It had to be, you know, click, you know, referencing or depicting a clearly identified federal candidate, 30 days before a primary, 60 days before a general, and capable of being heard by, heard or seen by 50,000 people in the state of district. Well, the IRS kind of skipped part of that. Yep. They, that, and that 50,000 people being heard by, or seen by your own voter, people who vote for you, that's a pretty significant omission. Because you can have somebody, I mean, this, this event that John was describing, you can have an event and, you know, before the election and have in Tulsa and have a candidate for, you know, Norman, Oklahoma, and nobody in the room can vote for that candidate, it's still a candidate-related political activity. They did none of the limiting that, uh, that the FEC actually has done over the years and has had, you know, for good or for ill, had to listen to all the likes of us. And, uh, and, it, and you see it over and over again in those regulations. And you're right, and I think that is a really key thing the IRS is ill-equipped and it's certainly not the agency that should be making decisions like that. It would be entitled, in my view, to no Chevron deference because they have absolutely no idea what they're doing in this area. I, I have a slightly different view, and it's not because I hold the IRS in higher esteem than anyone else, or lower esteem for that matter, but as long as Congress distinguishes between different types of tax exempt status, on the basis of whether or not they do or the extent to which they do candidate election activities, the IRS doesn't have any choice. So Congress, I think, I wish Senator McConnell had gotten his way perhaps in 2000 and successfully applied the disclosure requirements of Section 527 political organization status to all 501c groups or C4, C5, C6s as he was then advocating. But Senator McConnell didn't get his way as the advocate for disclosure he once was. Um, so that's the world we're left in. I also point out that the FEC isn't particularly good at administering campaign finance law, and they're the full-time agency to do it. Um, with respect to Crossroads GPS, the IRS is being criticized by House Ways and Means today for scrutinizing Crossroads GPS. Well, guess what? The campaign legal side didn't just write to the IRS complaining about Crossroads GPS. We wrote to the FEC. We filed a complaint. The FEC's Office of General Counsel concluded that Crossroads GPS violated federal campaign finance law for many of the same reasons, for the same activity that's at issue before the IRS. And the FEC itself deadlocked 3-3 on whether to more fully investigate Crossroads GPS. So we are now suing the FEC. Campaign Legal Center is part of the legal team representing 
public campaign, I'm, I'm sorry, public citizen and a group called protectourelections.org, suing the FEC for not investigating Crossroads GPS. So um, I have plenty of problems and gripes with the FEC. And so I'm, uh, the idea of just, well, the IRS is a good idea, let's let the really expert FEC take care of it. And one final point um, with respect to Cleta's remarks around the McCain-Feingold law and the tailoring of the election and communications um, restrictions in the McCain-Feingold law to broadcast into 50,000 people. Um, that was based on a robust evidentiary record that was compiled over several years of academic studies, empirical research about political advertising on TV. The data available was largely TV data, and that's what the studies were based on. And that's mainly what candidates for federal office use. So I agree with Cleta that's a really good attribute of the federal Electionary and communications definition, but the IRS had a slightly harder job because they're dealing with organizations that are involved not only in federal elections, but also in elections where you can have a major impact on vote outcomes by using media other than TV and radio. And that describes most non federal elections where they do direct mail. That's mostly what goes on, a little bit of radio. And so if the IRS is drawing a distinction in between Canada election activity and other stuff, and that has to apply with full force in city council races and mayoral races and county board of supervisor races. Um, then the same exact criteria that the FEC relied or that Congress relied upon in, in defining election and communication for federal election purposes doesn't quite work. Course, that being said, I uh, I stated earlier I think the IRS went too far in covering within that scope of the 30-60 day test some forms of communication that involve no money whatsoever. Whereas I think money is what really matters at the bottom of all this. So, my favorite is that they included the definition of candidate, someone that people had talked about as a candidate. That's terrible. It's just crazy. It's it is crazy. It's crazy. Any other questions? Thanks. So, um, John, you're talking about the, the bright line guidelines that you were working on, and it wasn't crystal clear to me. So, for one of your the bright lines, were crystal clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, for one of your safe harbors, and uh, if you talk about what that you could talk about different candidates' positions on things, and include your organization's own position. No. But how do you draw a line where I mean, if, you know, an organization says, "Well, this candidate is in favor of killing the and this candidate." Isn't or whatever, and where they were, you know, we're pro-life or whatever. How, like, where do you draw that line? Where that's you're basically saying I, 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 I draw the line. Ah, but I'm not saying vote for that person. Look, I, I acknowledge that our bright lines test allows activities that are going to make people more or less likely to vote for somebody. It's absolutely true. But everything that we've carved out as a safe harbor is something that we think is important enough as a matter of public policy to allow that we're willing to countenance that. And we're trying, we've tried not to. Tell us if we're wrong. These aren't written in stone, much less IRS regulations. Um, we've tried to avoid creating chasm-like loopholes that people are going to drive huge Soros money or Coke money or say to Mitchell money. You get lots of money, right? Um, through yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm, if, if, if these were immediately enacted as we've written them, you could put out a voter guide saying candidate X is um, a dreadful baby killer and candidate Y really believes in women's re reproductive rights and, and doesn't want uh, government's hands on her body. And we think this. And make it explicitly clear which of those candidates we prefer. And it's okay. And that's okay. Well, thank you all very much for your time this evening. It was a fantastic panel. Very exciting. We thank everyone.